Mike has coached Olympic medal winning crews in America, in the UK, coached the first women's medal in the UK Olympics, coached in Canada. He's been everywhere, everywhere he's gone, success has followed. Um, one of the great links between these two is that Mike actually coached Martin to his Olympic gold medal in 84. So I think it'll be a fascinating conversation. Mike, thanks very much for coming. And Martin, far away. Um, Mike, great privilege for, for me to chat to you. Really excited about this. Um, one of the things that we were talking about just before was, was your competitive nature as as uh, an originally an oarsman, a 1958 gold medal in the double mm. skulls in the Commonwealth Games. Um, and one of the questions that was asked here was, you know, how many people were satisfied with their rowing career as, um, before they went into coaching? And I think most people put their hands down. So mm. as a competitive, in terms of being a competitive, a highly competitive person, how does that work for you as a coach with the crews that you've coached and selected? Well, of course, we have to. A bit closer. Uh, we, we have to define what we mean by competitive. Are we talking about competitive in a boat, racing, winning a race? Are we talking about competitive with a program? Or even to the point of are we being competitive about the way we row? And when I started sculling, uh, I loved it. I loved the sport. I loved the way the boat moved and wanted to do well. And I wanted to be good in that boat, not just how fast, but how well I did it. And so that competitive element becomes then part of your life. So when you're coaching athletes, you're teaching them to be competitive, but you're treating them to be in, in a constructive way, not just trying to beat the opposition, but trying to be better yourself, trying to improve yourself. So yes, and that works very well with athletes because normally you get a very good response. So one of the things, because you've got such a particular philosophy, is, is how you're talking about winning the trust of athletes. Um, how you sort of do that to win the trust of athletes in terms of a program. When you went to Canada, first of all, it was a big job to win over the athletes to your philosophy and the, your particular type of training. How do you do that? Well, you create, you create an environment that involves everyone. I had a, a principle when I coached that anyone could join the program, whether you were 50 or 60, whether you were never going to compete, or whether you just did it for fun, or whether you wanted to win an Olympic medal. And that bringing everybody into the program gave everyone a measure of, as to how well they were performing. And it was not uh, too long before athletes then learn from each other and then want to be better than each other and so it creates a competitive environment. So talking about the competitive environment, um, I know one of the things we did in 84 was we bashed the hell out of each other in pairs and singles so we had a, most of the time a highly competitive environment. How much in your training program do you pit crews one against the other? Or how much do you allow them to train by themselves at their own pace? <clears throat> well, the small boat always comprised the basis of the program. We were trained in small boats. You need more skill. It's a higher skill level. You, need, um, you don't have to rely on somebody else for a partner. So if you're sculling or in a pair. And so rain, training in small boats always formed the basis of the group. Now, of course, if you're training in a pair, I want to be with that athlete every day, watch every stroke, and so they all have to be together. So the pair, so the, the squad would row as a, a group, we'd have 15, 20 boats, 20 pairs on the water training together. And because they're all training together, of course, they're measuring themselves against each other. And to uh, element some control, uh, the rate, they were controlling to rate. So I controlled, controlled the rate. Now, three things determine how fast the boat's going to travel. Uh, the first one is power, of course, how fast the plane travels through the water, and how long the stroke is, length is very important, and rate of striking. And so by controlling, I eliminated rate of striking and said, right, we're going to row at a given rate. Everyone is going to row at that rate. So, and 22 was the base rate. 
Uh, 22 is a good rate because it allows you to do huge mileage and it allows athletes time to control what they're doing, to control the movements they're making. And we controlled it from the coaching boat. Every athlete was clocked with the rate every stroke they took, or well, not every stroke, every few strokes. And so with everyone rowing at the same rate, they had to focus on the quality of the stroke, the length of stroke, the power of the stroke. And of course, because they're in a group, they could measure themselves against each other. And, and so we got a, a huge improvement in, in, all, in those two areas by controlling the rate and with everyone training together. So are those principles that you've taken with you throughout your career, say from the first time that you coached in the Olympics in 76 in the double skull to when you were coaching Russia just in the 2016 Olympics, are those principles of power and, and length and, and rate or have you, how have you noticed any change in techniques that you've adopted yourself as a coach? Or have they been principles that you've remained true to throughout your coaching career? Well, they've been principles that have remained, yes, throughout my coaching career. Uh, when I coached the lightweight first, we rode at weekends and on the tideway, and you could row with the stream together alongside each other in singles. Uh, we had no pairs, we had no money, we had to bring our own boats and we, and I rode with them, I rode with the athletes, sculled with the athletes and we would scull from, from Chiswick down to um, past Putney and um, then come back one at a time against the tide. Um, when I got into the Martins crew we had to row on the smaller river and there were a few of us and so uh, the pairs didn't have quite the same effect as they did when we were the group. When I went to Canada, we had open water and we would row 20 pairs abreast. The same in the USA, same in Russia. <coughs> have 20 pairs abreast, all rowing at the same rate and measuring themselves, their performance against each other. So with that technique, we talked earlier about the influence of Steve Fairburn. I don't know how widely known you, Steve Fairburn might be to the guys here. Perhaps you could might say a bit about who he was, but how much Fairburn's principles have influenced you as a coach? Um, Martin asked a question before you came in. How did any coach ever influence what I do? And I said, well, no, nobody influenced my coach because we didn't have a coach. When I when we rode, we were amateurs, we rode early morning and late at night. Uh, I saw a coach at Marlow Rowing Club maybe once a week who came down and said, move your hands a bit faster or slower or whatever. We didn't have a coach. I said the only influence I had was a man called Steve Fairburn. And Steve Fairburn was an English coach of early, early in the century. Uh, what happened is, this is a long story guys, <laughs> Sport in those days was a, a summertime activity. You didn't row in the winter. When I rowed, we only rowed from March through to, um, to the end of July. And then the club closed down in the winter. When I started sculling, then I would go out on my own in the dark, on my own, with no one around, across flood water. Um, because that was the way it was. Up until that point, therefore, because you're only rowing for three months of a year, then the technique takes a long time to develop. And so technique was priority, it became very important. Steve Fairburn came into, um, into Great Britain and started coaching and he advocated mileage. Mileage makes champions is one of his favorite cries. And he said, technique is less important, what's important is you do the mileage. And so that did have a big influence on me and I spent, yes, many, many miles on the water. So in that way, Steve Fairman did have an enormous influence on me in my early days. One of the things that strikes me as a coach, I remember <coughs> how many sessions you were at, you, you hardly ever, or perhaps never missed a session. How important is it for you as a coach to be there all the time, to be at all the sessions, to be watching your athletes? <coughs> I think it was crucial. I think it was a, a crucial part of, uh, of, the coach, of the coaching situation. I know that if I'm not there, the athletes do not train with the same competitive instincts as when I'm there. And there are times when you have to go away, I have to go to a conference, but it was always planned. 
And I must say that I only ever missed one, in the whole of my coaching career, I only ever missed one session, well, one day, and that was coaching British women. I was in bed with Fluenta. I didn't miss one session. It was important to me to be there 100%. One of the things you've done as a coach is you've set up training programs. I know, for example, using the base at Marlow, but particularly for the Americans, you moved to San Diego on the West Coast, which wasn't an obvious place. I know for the Canadians, you moved the squad to Vancouver Islands, which wasn't an obvious place necessarily. Can you tell us something about your philosophy, about what it is that you wanted about the environment and why perhaps against officialdom you, pers you persisted in trying to get these training centres up and running? As I explained, the rowing was very much a summer sport and this meant that countries like Canada, which is frozen for many months of a year, um, they didn't row through winter so it suited that environment. And so the rowing developed in the west coast, the east coast of Canada, Toronto, London, Ontario, around that area. When I was asked to go to Canada, I said, yes, I would like to go, to, I, with tongue in cheek, I must say, I said, I, but I need to go to a place where we can go all year round. And they said, well, there's only one place you can do that, and that's Vancouver Island. I said, that's where I want to be. So they, they agreed and they sent up me to Vancouver Island. When I got there, there were just two athletes training on the water. And then gradually, as things developed, they more and more moved, and now it's the rowing centre. So you talked about how when you, you went to Canada, we, we talked about the training program that you had here before the 88 Olympics, where you had devised this kind of almost ma mathematical progression pyramids and castles based around the idea that the hardest session could be rating 30 for 30 minutes. And then you would lengthen that out to say rating 28 for 40 minutes and, and uh, 26 for 50 minutes and so on. And how did that develop or not? How did you develop that? Because after the Seoul Olympics, you went to Canada. How did that develop? And is that, was that still the basis of what you were doing with the Americans, later the Canadians again, and then the Russians? <clears throat> by controlling the rates, by keeping the rates low, as I explained earlier, <clears throat> it gives athletes opportunity to complete the movement successfully. It's easier to move if you're moving slowly. If you want to control a movement at a very high rate, it's more difficult. And as coaches, we tend to um, stop a crew when we see the te technique deteriorating as they get tired and as they row at high rates. And so I then realized, I appreciated the rate of striking had a big impact on how a crew developed. And of course, if we're doing miles, miles and miles, and training for hours, then the more variety you can bring into the program, the better the concentration. And so if you change the rate at frequent intervals, like every two or three minutes, and when you made the rate of change, I would give them a technical point. At this point, when we rate from 22 to 24, we're going to focus on keeping the legs firm at the finish of the stroke or drawing the hands to the finish. So they would have a technical point every time the rate changed. And of course, by changing the rate, it added variety, it gave more interest, it added a, another degree to the level of training. One thing that um, was apparent then through the middle 80s was that we would be very strong in the early regattas, we would go to Europe for the World Cup, they weren't World Cup, they were regattas, and we would be very, very strong, and it would be very and we then found it harder to hold the best positions through the season, until we came to the Worlds and we weren't as strong. And, and so going into Seoul, and this is probably what Martin is talking about, I said, right, our training base is going to be 22 through the winter, and then the first regatta, we're going to race at 36. And uh, Martin's not going to like this answer. <laughs> we're going to race at 36. And then when we go to Lucerne, we're going to race at 38. And then when we go to the Olympics, free rate, go at rate, uh, rate like. And the important thing was to hold the quality at those rates. For the first regatta, all of the crews except Martin 
rode at 36 and won a medal, except Martin's crew, which went over at 40 all the way and didn't, which I didn't like. We then went to Lucerne and the same thing happened. And this time they were even further down. And this really pissed me off because, <laughs> because they clearly hadn't followed the program. Now the, the eight and the four had followed the program. They stuck to the rates and they did very well. They both won medals. At that point, if my Marty remembers, I then got in my car and came down. And we, I went out with them every day through the week up until the Olympics, up until we left for the Olympic camp. And then, of course, when we came to the Olympics, everyone came fourth. The lowest position we had was fourth. Martin's crew was delighted, and the other crews were pissed off. <laughs> Do you remember that, Martin? <laughs> I, can, I can remember being quite awkward at times. <laughs> Just, just as an aside, bear in mind, I was an awkward oarsman to coach and I had my own opinion and, and didn't mind expressing it. Um, <clears throat> there was a question earlier about how people dealt with bad apples. I'm not sure if I call myself a bad apple, but presumably you've had to deal with a lot of athletes that didn't necessarily like either the training program or what you were doing, or maybe they weren't getting enough attention. How have you dealt with those athletes? Is it the case of saying, right, well, you're too much of a problem for the system and you need to be out? What, what have you done? Maybe you can think of one or two examples. Hmm. Um, well, I'll jump in and say that Martin was a, a pleasure to coach most of the time and he worked very hard and no one was more dedicated and put the effort in that Martin did. And so it was just uh, the situation at the time. And of course, there are, every athlete has the point where they, um, to, there are a level to which they will commit and then it's getting them beyond that level of commitment. So I adopted very early in my coaching career principle that it was the coach's choice. If you, I can show you what to do, I don't want to make you do it, I can push you and stress you and force you or not force you. I can push you, but I can't force you. If you don't want to do it, then you don't have to do it. And so I would push an athlete. If an athlete was being lazy, or I would push for two or three days, and then say to him, right, I've pushed you for three days, now I'll back off. And normally that was very effective, because they would then try even harder. And yes, there are athletes, of course, down the road, that, that object to the level of training. <clears throat> I always, but I always advocated it was their choice. It was their choice of coach. I didn't have to be the coach. If they preferred another coach, they were welcome to go to another coach. And yes, athletes did say, OK, we'll go to another coach. And I don't want to mention names. But had that freedom to train at the level and with whom they wanted to train. If they didn't want to do the program, that's fine. You could do the program elsewhere. But but if you do the program here, you must comply with the rules that everyone's complying with. You can't have your rule and for yourself and another rule for somebody else. Everyone had to follow the same program. So um, <clears throat> with the athletes that you had, I know one of the things that's really important that you, you talk about is the <laughs> idea of motivation. And um, we were looking just before you, you arrived, Mike, and how many times your um, YouTube clip on motivation has been viewed and I think it's something like half a million was that right <laughs> looking at that um, when you see what you've got to offer on motivation what is it that you can bring as a coach to athletes to help motivate them well what motiv motivates an athlete more than anything is improvement it motivates all of us if we want to do something and we improve, it motivates us to want to do better. And so we have to create a situation whereby an athlete knows how he can improve, or he or she can improve, and that that person is improving. And so improvement is the, the big factor. Now whilst we trained, I'll just throw this in, whilst we trained together and everyone was measuring themselves against each other, more or less every performance, well most performances, um, what, what, what you had to be, what I had to be aware of was that 
athletes would pick and choose when they were then going to try and when they were not going to try. You know, will Mike think more of me if I win the first one, if I'm in the lead in the first one or in the last one? And so they, they would pick and choose the areas in which the times where they wanted to excel. And of course that stifles performance, it puts a ceiling on performance, it doesn't, it doesn't help them to be better than they are. And so there was no competitiveness in those training environments. Competitiveness was deliberately avoided. Um, yes, we would start more or less level, but never absolutely level, and there would never be a finishing line, there would never be, you've won that row, you haven't won that row, but on the other hand, you had to know if you were improving or not. And so every Saturday morning, we would have timepieces. And the timepieces were done for several reasons, but the main reason was so that they could see whether they were making progress or not, whether they were in getting better or not. And that's the only time through the winter, through training, that any level of performance was measured just it just struck me as if you've got 20 crews as a coach how do you allot your time to 20 crews i mean i know you're on the water for a long time maybe an hour and a half or, or a couple of hours but with 20 boats how does what sort of a challenge does that present you with as a coach um, well of course you can't coach everyone every session every day and um, we would have coaching sessions in the week and each person would get each crew would get an element of my personal one-on-one -on -one time. And that would normally be in the middle of the morning. We would have three sessions a day, maybe sometimes four. We would train from 7.30 to 9.30, and again from 11.30 to 12.30 with the technical session, and, and so forth. And <clears throat> anyone who wanted help would ask for it. And when we came in, when we paddled in from the session, I would always be the last boat to follow, I've got a coach boat, creating a wake, I want to make sure everyone gets safely to the shore. Anyone who wanted my help would wait and I would follow them in and help them in. I'd be watching them during the session so I would, could see anything that needed correcting. I would say, you come in last and I'll follow you in. There was a technical session as I explained, every three or four days a week there was a technical session when it was one on one. An athlete would come to me and say, will you give me help? I have a problem, we can't balance the boat, my oar is sticking. So I would then give them a session, I'd arrange for them in the lunch hour or between sessions, and the session in. So everyone had all the coaching that they needed, I think. And one of the things about <coughs> the environment that you created, I know what, you hardly ever would cut an outing, no matter how bad the conditions were, I guess um, I, I've heard you say, save for fog. What do you think was the importance of that in your training regime? Uh, yes, sometimes the conditions were pretty bad. We would, and um, very, very seldom would a session be stopped because of conditions. Yes, we couldn't carry out the program because the conditions allow the program, but we, but you know, the, the main, um, there were two areas that stopped us definitely. One was when the lake froze and, and one when it was thick fog. We had to be able to see the length of the lake before, before we would go out in the fog. When it was rough water, the wind blows from a direction and from whatever wind that direction, <coughs> there's going to be flat water. It's, it's obvious. And so we would then go and find the flat water. And often that meant rowing through really rough water to get there. And when we got to the flat water, then we would make the best we could. We'd have to change the program, have to adjust it, because you obviously can't row as a group in, along the bank of a shore, a shore of a bank. But the, the, the element of not giving in, of always finding a way, always looking to go ahead was the important principle. We wouldn't just give up because something was in for stopping us. It had to be a genuine stop before we did stop. Just let's turn our attention now to technique in terms of uh, go through the stroke. Thinking about the front end of the stroke, I know one of the sort of phrases you use was sting and float when we used to row in the quad in the early 80s and then in the four. <clears throat> just thinking about the front end of the stroke, 
has that remained a constant for you, how the blade gets put into the stroke and how the oarsman should be at the front end of the stroke? Or have there been any developments? I, I, I'm aware that some of the time that the blades now might enter in more softly in the front end and be connected before, uh, make sure the blade's connected to the boat before any push goes. But uh, how does that go with your idea of how an oarsman should put the blade in at the front end? <laughs> Three things determine how fast the boat will travel. One is how much power you apply, how fast the blade travels through the water. If the blade travels through the water at 100 miles an hour, the boat's going to travel at 100 miles an hour. If it goes through the water at 2 miles an hour, it'll go at 2 miles an hour. Length of stroke and rate of striking, as I explained. Regarding where should you place emphasis on the stroke, as soon as you grip the water, the boat moves, it accelerates. So the stroke must accelerate. So the faster the acceleration, the faster the boat is going to travel. And it's length of stroke. And length of stroke means the length, the time the blade is in the water moving the boat. The blade grips the water, and it pushes the finish. And so at no point are you going to say, we need a stronger catch and a soft finish, because it all has to be related. <coughs> the acceleration, the power, if you drive the catch hard, the finish must be harder than the catch, otherwise it's, you're not gaining full benefit of the catch. Um, it, over the years, crews have emphasized the catch and finishes, and I've seen crews emphasize a very fast, very hard, powerful catch, and I've seen crews throw with a very hard, powerful finish. And whatever way you choose, somebody will do the opposite and beat you. So I think one of the things that your crews were, were quite noted for in terms of the difference between your, yourself and, and other crews was this very long lean back at the finish in the early 2000s, which I think I've heard you talk about before, and it was almost that the, the guy, you, you sort of suggested the guys kind of develop that themselves. Perhaps you can... Say a bit about that. I'm, I'm conscious that perhaps in the later crews, like for example the Russians, they didn't see quite the same technique. So that seemed to stand out. What was going on there for you? <clears throat> um, the, <clears throat> the, the story is that uh, a German who was God's gift to rowing and knew everything told me that the crews, my crews, were rigged too too low, that they should be rigged higher that the, when the blade is covered, your hand should be level with your shoulder, so that you had a straight draw through. And uh, I acknowledged, yes, okay, yes, 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 but ignored it, of course, because I didn't agree. I didn't agree with it. But he persisted, and my competitive instinct, if you like, um, I gave him an answer and said, then, the, it may be stronger at the catch, I don't think it is, but it may be stronger at the catch, but it certainly isn't at the finish, because you're drawing up to your shoulder. He said, now you're talking about finishes. Finishes are of no value at all. You finishes are of no use, which of course was nonsense. It's the speed with which the blade sends the boat, not anything else. And so I said, okay, I'll prove you wrong. And so through the winter, we worked on finishes. <laughs> and what I found, what the guys found is because they are now rowing at 22, the stroke was longer by rowing further, and so they rowed further, and the competitive instinct amongst themselves created a very long swing at the finish. And it was a powerful swing, and on the ergometers, the scores increased enormously. Well, hugely, percentage-wise, hugely. Of course, when you're racing, you don't have time to swing back. You're striking 38, 40, and so when we raced, crews didn't see it. And we were winning, but they didn't see why we were winning. I'm not saying it's because of the finish, but it certainly helped. And then we were training before the Worlds in Barcelona. And the Russians saw us training at 22 and saw the lean back and copied. And gradually it got around that the Canadians have a long lean back at the finish. And then a lot of countries started copying. It wasn't the lean back, it was the emphasis that was placed onto the stroke. Just thinking about the crews that you've coached the gold medals, uh, maybe it would be easy to look at the two Canadian eights that won in 1992 and 2008. Um, 
I remember that 2008 crew and it was an outstanding eight. I'll probably I'd maybe place them above the 92 eight. I don't know what your view would be, but what were the ingredients that went into those two gold medal successes? Could you sort of put your finger on anything in terms of what you did as a coach or the type of athletes you had or what the athletes were doing that brought that gold medal success? <coughs> Whilst while, while we coaches like to think that we've won the medal, it's really the athletes that win. And if you don't have quality athletes, you, you cannot win. And the quality athletes in 92, uh, not 92, two, in Los Angeles were, were superb, superb athletes. It was quite different in 92 because we'd gone through an era where Canadian rowing was at a pretty low standard and rowing the world worldwide was still very much a summer sport. It wasn't a professional sport. Very few countries <coughs> were able to train 24 hours a day. Of course, the Eastern Bloc did before the wall came down. But in, but in, <coughs> but in the West, we all had jobs. And so in 92, the Canadian eight raised themselves above uh, what they were above their qualities as they would in normal oarsmen. They were not brilliant oarsmen. There were some very good oarsmen amongst them. Derek Porter went on to win the following year in a single sculling boat and win the world the um, the world championships. So yes, the Canadian eight was not the fastest eight at ninety two, but it was certainly uh, set a lead. Uh, the crew in Los Angeles they were all outstanding athletes and. And as good as any crew I've seen. Could I just press you a bit further on that, that crew in Beijing? Because um, the British Eight, I think, was a fantastic crew that year that got the silver medal. What was it about the program in 2008 for Beijing that really worked for you, really made a difference? And I have to sort of recall that the previous Olympics, you had not been so successful with the Canadian Eight. You went for I know gold medals in the four and the eight, and you got silver in the four and the eight didn't manage to medal. So mm -hmm. I guess what maybe learnings did you institute from that into your programme for the 2008 programme, which made a difference? Um, I meant when I said Los Angeles. I meant Beijing. I, I apologise for that. In, we went into um, nine, 2004, talking about me. We're talking about Sid uh, Sydney Olympics, yeah. not Sydney, what's the other one after Sydney? Athens. Athens, Athens Olympics, right. And we went into athletes as favourites, having won the world championship for the two years running. <clears throat> and we also had a very good four, so we had 12 top class athletes. So the, the eight had a problem in the, in the, the stroke head, broke, pulled a muscle in his shoulder. We couldn't row the eight for two or three days. And so when we went in to, to race, they didn't perform at their best. And when they were not in the position they, short, they thought they should have been, then it had a, a huge psychological impact. So, <clears throat> the, but the athletes in, in, that, in that year were not quite as good as they were, or, because they, four years later they had another four years. So the core of that crew were determined to put that right and carried on. But by now they'd had another four years. Now Kyle Hamilton, for example, who stroked the eight that won in Beijing, um, was a, a novice two years before before we went into into the race in Athens. Um, he um, had only just started rowing, and so when he went into Athens, he was nowhere near the quality of oarsman that he was when he stroked the eight in Beijing. And similarly, um, we had. Um, athletes that come in that had not performed well but with another three or four years and the determination to put right that error was resulted in the performance in Beijing. So with, with those <coughs> eights, how obvious was the selection? What kind of process did you have for selection? Was it all done in pairs? Did you seat race in fours? Did you seat race in the eight? Mm. Well, we did. Uh, you did touch on the question of how crews were selected before for this meeting, and and uh, the the way that I preferred to select crews would be to 
in the first instance would identify the top athletes. <clears throat> if these athletes are not in the boat, we're not going to win. Everyone knew that. Everyone wants to row with these top athletes. Um, so why do we need to select them? Why do we need to test them? He's not in the boat, they're <laughs> not going to win. Everyone knew that. So, as I say, why test? So I would identify um, several athletes that everyone knew would be top, and then we would seat the race the rest. And normally it would leave two athletes, there was doubt around two athletes, and we would row a test, and the test would be a time trial. <clears throat> We'd row 1,500 metres in one direction, and half the distance, 750 in the other. The athletes being tested would choose which direction they rode, and they, they would choose the timing of the row, and uh, if they wanted, and they would obviously row the um, one against the wind, the long one with the wind, and the short one against the wind, and they would make that choice. And the, the test then is being put in the hands of the athletes, isn't it? The athletes and the crew are actually, if there is any influence, if there is an unfairness, then it's from the crew, it's not from the coach, because they will um, determine who, they, they are, we will determine the test. And it was the fairest way of, because it's the athlete's event, it's the athlete's sport, it's the athletes that are most important. And they should have, they should be comfortable with the crew that they are <coughs> going to row with. Losing my voice a bit here. <coughs> we'll have one more question from here and then I think open it up to the floor. Mike, you've, you've had a lot of great athletes that you've coached, you know, Steve Redgrave, um, Jamie Coven, Derek Porter you mentioned, Malcolm Howard. Is there something you can say about what is it that makes those athletes that you go first into the boat that makes a difference, those Olympic gold medal athletes that you've seen over your career? What is it that makes that difference? Well, of course, a physiological factor plays a huge perform a huge role in performance. Um, a huge impact in the sport is is oxygen uptake, and those athletes that you mentioned had high uptake. And Malcolm Howard was not as high, but Stephen Redgrave was very high, and and uh, Derek Porter and Jamie Coven. But obviously, they also had to have a determination. Uh, a competitive instinct, which was natural. It wasn't something that you needed to create. Which all you needed to do was to show them the way. And then they, their own competitive nature would want to be successful to follow that way. Thank you, Mike. I think, uh, obviously, Mike's got some <coughs> fascinating takes on things and stories. Open it up to the floor now to questions from you guys. And I'll repeat the question in case you can't hear it. Don't be shy. Oh, yeah, thank you. My voice is... I'm not used to talking for so long. <laughs> yes, sir. So, <clears throat> you mentioned uh, giving the athletes a choice of whether to be in your program or being coached by you or, or elsewhere, but that, that freedom is quite important. Um, and I, I suppose at a national level, they can choose. Um, how do you apply... How are you kind of trying to create that feeling in a closed market where you're at a school or a university and actually the athletes either row with you or don't row. Um, how do you create that feeling that they're actually choosing to do the training and that they want to be there and they want to do it? Did everyone hear that question? Yeah. You see, the, if, if, the, if the athlete doesn't have 100% confidence, then you're not going to it, you're not going to reach your best. You either you have to have confidence in what you're being told, and if you don't have that confidence, neither is going to be successful, neither the coach nor the athlete. And so as a coach, I don't really want to be coaching somebody that would prefer somebody else. If they don't agree or don't subscribe to what I'm, I'm asking them to do, that's fair enough, I accept that. So I don't have to be your coach, you find someone who does. And so it's a catch two situation. Right? When you come to colleges, college rowing and team rowing, then uh, you could still imply an element of that. 
Um, but it's normally a different, a different environment. A college crew will have been together maybe one or two years. Um, national team athletes would have been rowing at that level for a long, much longer period. So with colleges and, and schools, um, of which I have little experience or little no experience, it's more likely that the athletes will uh, follow the coach to what the coach says without questioning whether they will object to what being, they're being told. There are exceptions, but it doesn't happen quite the same in colleges as it would in national team. It's not a precise answer, but... Thank you. Yes, sir. Yes. Um, so you mentioned in Athens, um, the eights found themselves in a situation they didn't expect to be in, which was not winning. Um, how did you reflect on that, and what changes did you make uh, to the program between Athens and Beijing? I have to say, just before Mike answers that, the race, the heat where the Americans got drawn against the Canadians is one of the best all-time eights races I've seen, where the Americans just won, I think, and both crews <coughs> dipped under the previous world record. So it was, that was in Athens, in the heat, yeah. Um, the Americans were expected to be strong in that race, and it was unfortunate that uh, the, the way the crews were seeded, uh, it put the two best crews in the, in the seed, because the Americans had not performed, they'd not raced prior to that. They had an eight that raced in Lucerne, but it was only half of the eight. The other f four, because Teddy was juggling or playing games, probably asked, assessing whether a four would be better target than the eight. Uh, when they raced, uh, the, the Americans just won by about two or three feet in the end. And, but what happened is that the stroke pulled a muscle in that race and so he couldn't row them for two or three days. And this is, is bound to affect the psychology of everyone in the crew. And we've just lost by two feet and now we're not rowing for two or three days. The, um, the chances of us... Now, when you commit to an Olympic final, it's close to maximum, if not maximum. And so, at any specific part of a race, when things have not gone as planned, the psychology is hugely influenced. And, and racing is 90% psychology, you know. An athlete can only perform at the highest level once, maybe twice a year, and you choose, the coach has to choose when that's going to be. Because if it's in a heat, you're not going to get through. You're not going to win the final, right? So the, the skill of the coach is to plan it so that that 100% commitment is in that last race. Yeah. To do that in that situation was a tough call. Yeah. The psychology of um, not winning the heat, committing 100%, and then losing a man for a few days was, was huge. Thank you very much. Yeah, sorry. Mike, to the extent you're willing to do so, are you, are you able to take us through um, the lead up to an Olympic final? Uh, specifically, on the, the, the final kind of two hours before, and your interactions with the with the crew in those last few hours. Uh, which Olympic final? <laughs> 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 uh, in, uh, in, in London? Yeah. <clears throat> okay. And the crew in its preparation, was it was a very powerful crew and in preparation, were running times uh, better than world record times. But of course, over shorter distance, uh, uh, you couldn't produce a record time over 2,000 meters, but you can certainly do it at no distances. And so the crew went into the race 
into London very, <coughs> very confident, and I was confident too. But the, they were young, or cuff, yeah, there were wonderful young people in the crew, overzealous, and really tried to break the world record in the, in the heat, and went off at an enormous pace, and um, only got just a small margin. But then I observed, I watched the, I watched the race, on, and I then looked at it on video, and the, the movement of the bodies was so much, the boat was doing this. So if you look at the heat, you'll see that the boat actually bounces much more than it should. And it's because of the venom, the vitality, let's go guys, you know. And to conv this was the, a, big, um, a big obstacle for me, because how do you tell a crew in repercharge, an Olympic repercharge, <coughs> not to try so hard. So yes, it was a big test. And for the first time in my coaching career, I actually um, was aggressive with the crew. <coughs> you don't do that. That's silly, you're being childish. The only time I ever raised my voice, and it was in the Olympic Games, but they got the message and then in the <coughs> um, and then in the repechage, they did control it better, not, but it was, and then in the final, did control it really well. And so to win silver was um, very, you know, it was quite exciting to win silver. Had they, once, if I thought they were going to win silver for the race, I'd have been disappointed because I expected them to win gold. But to win silver in those circumstances, meant that they'd raised their gain, they'd lifted themselves out of that hole that they'd dug for themselves. Okay, so, Adrian, you going to wrap it up? Yeah. Thank you very much to the